Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show and today I thought I'd start the video by sharing a post I put on Facebook on the Facebook group this is the Urban Gentry Watch Club and I put it last night it's at the top of the feed if you guys haven't seen it yet I, it's, I posted it 11 hours ago and already if we scroll down had a huge response 200, 249 likes and over a hundred comments. The post was, I shared my medium term goal, which as you guys know is the Rolex, the Pepsi, the pre-ceramic Pepsi, which I'm aimed to get by the end of the year. And I found this little gorgeous picture of one. I haven't precisely decided which particular model, but it's gonna be pre-ceramic, most likely a 90s one. Anyway, please share yours in the comment below. So, uh, let's have a look. Beautiful, what is that? A beautiful Zin chronograph there. Uh, from Cody, uh, Noel posted the uh, Squally 1521, perfectly understandable, it's gorgeous, it really is gorgeous, uh, quite a few Panerais there, lovely, I, I, I finally understand what the fuss is with the <laughs> Panerais, Tissot Visodate, gorgeous, gorgeous watch, Tudor, Classic Seamaster, and the Bond one, Submariner of course, of course, and Orient there, uh, Tag Heuer there, very nice Tag Heuer. I, I do like the Aqua Racer, I've got to admit, I do like it a lot. Fantastic. I love the fact that there's watches of all price ranges. Oh, beautiful, uh, the classic, the classic Khaki King Auto. You can't go wrong with that. Black Bay Bronze, very nice. Jason said the, 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 the Saab, the same as my 30th birthday. Good on you, mate. Another Tudor, a lot of, quite a lot of Tudors, Breitling. Super Ocean Heritage, of course. Lots of Tudors. Lots and lots of Tudors. The Mudmaster, the new Mudmaster. Very cool choice indeed. <laughs> Federico says, do it! <laughs> uh, Grobnob's posted <laughs> the frog that he has taken a shine to. Unfortunately, we found out that it's a he and not a she. The infamous KGB's frog there. Or a 65, of course, absolutely gorgeous. Very nice, there's there's the Navi Timer. I think that's the same one as mine. Looks so cool on that strap. Nice one, Mohammed. very nice indeed. It's lots of speedies, uh, Satina there. Ooh, is that the Santos Cartier? Very nice. SKX, of course. Uh, Steinart OVM, Oris Aquis, very nice IWC there. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. GMT Master 2, another Squale. The North, not the North Pole, what's it called? North Flag, there we go. Gorgeous. Subby, lots of subs. This is quite an interesting comment. Uh, Farkan here said, uh, I really don't know about this watch. It's like you want it, but once you got it, you will prob end up selling after six months. Shock horror. Well, I actually replied to this and I said, yeah, maybe and maybe not. Uh, my keepers, the Subby, the Speedy, my Saab 0033, my 1521 Riseman. Uh, even this this little beauty here from Seiko, I've all had longer than six months. So I am capable of keeping a watch. I wish we could keep them all, right? Yeah, he's absolutely right. Yeah, I know I sell a lot of watches and, and I change my mind. But that's all part of the part of the fun of it. But I am capable of having keepers. And I've done a video on keepers. And... This for me is one of my keepers. And there's another keeper in there, in my little winder there. So I am capable of keepers, but anyway. Milgauss, of course. Uh, oh, look at that. Root Beer GMT, quite tempted to buy that, but the Moon Watch, speedy, gorgeous, gorgeous. Anyway, these are still coming in thick and fast. Planet Ocean, uh, Bluesy, Two-Tone, lovely, lovely. Oris Aquis, uh, quite a lot of Oris Aquis. Panerai again. Lots of GMTs, Tudors, the Alpamist, I don't blame you. Absolutely gorgeous watch. Fantastic response. Thank you to everybody who's uh, reversed. Oh, and somebody actually put, yeah, it's, it's your fault. <laughs> yes, the Young Hands, my new medium goal. So beautiful. Good for you, mate. It's absolutely gorgeous. Pure class. I, oh, God, it's, it's getting difficult because I'm falling in love with so many... Um, watches oh jlc master compressor good choice very nice oh and there we go there's there's the flighty the flighty um absolutely fantastic watch and there's a link to my video a lang a course of course and they just keep coming they just keep somebody wants a um gerard 
uh, Genta. I keep saying Gentra because I think I'm saying, you know, urban gentry, but my mind wants to say one thing and um, it's actually another. But anyway, I'm sorry, my dyslexic brain. Uh, Panorama KGB, okay, KDP, I should stop calling him KGB, but it's funny. Grobnob started it, blame him. The last post was nine minutes ago. They're still coming in, they're still coming in. A little bit of Facebook malarkey before we start the show. Let's roll the intro and get on with it. Hi guys and welcome to today's show. Today we're finally going to be doing the showdown, the mid-tier Swiss diver showdown. It's been long overdue. I've been kind of stuck to be honest on how to do it but I think in a moment when we switch perspectives you'll see that I've simplified it a bit. Uh, I've got all the scores together and we'll kind of go through their key strengths and weaknesses. Before we get into all of that I should do a wristwatch check. Now, it is a very dark, dingy, rainy day here in New York. Uh, my favorite type of weather, but fortunately it doesn't make for good lighting to do videos. But anyway, this is um, my little flighty, the flight master, uh, the Seiko flight master. It's, I'm not sure if you can see that. It's got that beautiful domed, there you can see the, the domed crystal there, Hardlex. Uh, Hardlex is greatly overrated, I think. It's a great little beta watch. This is actually one of my most affordable uh, watches. Very much an aviation, well, it's it's obviously an aviation watch. Has strong kind of styling cues for the Navi timer, but at the same time, it has its differences. This is this is what I was saying uh, in, the, in a video just the other day about Seiko. There's a Seiko out there for really for everything and for everybody. This one has a great little screw down pushes a bit like a Daytona and a 200 meter water resistance uh, fantastic quartz but yet has that analog sweep on the on the seconds hand of the chronograph beautiful uh, sub dial with two handed sub dial with dual time alarm stack of great little features I mean really is uh, one of the best bang per buck watches out there the great thing is it's uh, one of my most affordable watches too I think I've paid I think I paid about $120 when I when I first bought this. Uh, and it's definitely been a keeper in my collection. I just love it. It's a great all-round beta watch. Because it just has everything. Even even the slide rule you can use to do basic calculations. Anyway, we're not talking about that. Uh, a very long uh, wristwatch check. I do apologize. Now, before we change perspectives and have a closer look at these watches, I wanted to basically talk a little bit about the mid-tier. Now, this, believe it or not, this video comes about because it is one of the most frequently asked questions I get. And a lot of people, they want to buy, you know, they can't make their mind up. Should I buy the Squiler 1521? Should I buy the Glycine Combat Sub? The Marathon? They all have their strengths and weaknesses, and they're all around about the same price. But they're very, very different. thing is about this price range, you've got to remember is that no watch is perfect. The more you spend on a watch, the more likely it's going to be closer to perfection. But even the, you know, a $10,000, $20,000 watch is never going to be perfect. There is no such thing as perfection. Now, you do get closer to that level of perfection. You're going to get better finishing, higher quality, great movement, better features, better accuracy, all the rest of it. Uh, but the price goes up. Now, I really think the mid-tier is a sweet spot. It's a great stepping stone into the kind of luxury, dipping your feet in the water, especially for new collectors that there are so many of you out there. What you're getting at this kind of level is you're getting a really reliable watch. Most of them have the ETA or the Silita SW200. Some of them are even modified and improved by the companies like the Glycine Combat Sub. These are tried and tested reliable movements that really stand the test of time. The great thing is they're cheap and affordable to, to service and to maintain. Another thing is, is the step up in quality. Entry level watches like this, you know, the finishing is not going to be amazing. There's going to be little details that might not be perfect. But when you're stepping into the kind of mid-tier, you're getting a... a a taste of the, a little bit more luxurious finishing, like the Oris Aquis that I think has better finishing than some of the Amigas, you know. So 
you're almost getting that luxury quality finishing. Uh, not quite a luxury watch just yet, but getting, you know, it's a good stepping stone into the luxury market at least. And for a lot of you, it's going to be your first Swiss piece. You're going to get a taste of, of, of a Swiss watch. This goes back to the, the increase in quality you'll see from the entry level pieces. You'll see all of these pieces have sapphire glass, mid to top tier movements. If it's an ETA, the Celita is obviously a clone of the ETA. Uh, so you're seeing a step up there as well in performance and accuracy. The other thing is to consider is with mid-tier pieces, you're getting watches from brands with real heritage. I mean, look at Oris, over 100 years, fully independent. They've recently they've introduced the uh, the, the first analog altimeter, the first uh, depth gauge in the Aquis line, the higher end Aquises. They really are pushing the the technical envelope. They've got some amazing achievements in the last few years and incredible heritage behind them. And I really respect them because they're doing their own thing. You know, the Aquis is one of the most unique out of the bunch. Certainly, looking at Squale, for example, you've got that rich nautical history, uh, Jacques Mayal. Uh, connection there, you know, Le, Le Grand Bleu, they made cases for Doxa, Blanc Pan, Hoya, all the big, all the big boys way back in the day, in the kind of glory days, in the early days of, of diver watches, a really rich heritage there as well. Uh, you can say the same about the Glycine, they have some true icons in their range, like the Airman, and to a certain extent the, the Combat Sub is a bit of an icon, very un uh, underrated icon, um, highly overlooked, but you know, they saw action in uh, Vietnam and, and have a huge military following. But that doesn't mean to say that entry level pieces like the Seiko, I mean Seiko is a very historic, important brand horologically as well. Um, I'm not saying that you can't get that in entry level pieces, but it's just to bear in mind that, you know, with these smaller kind of independent brands, uh, you're getting a whole different type of heritage. Another thing to bear in mind is, and I've seen this, uh, some people don't consider mid-tier watches worth inheriting. Well, I inherited uh, my father's old automatic Seiko and, and it's, it was really kind of an entry level piece, but I was very proud of it. I think that kind of goes into a little bit of kind of the snobbery watch snobbery. I think any, any piece can be worthy of inheriting because it's the sentimental value attached to it, it's not the monetary value. If I was to hand down uh, my Squale 1521, you know, I'd, I'd be very proud of that piece. It's something that uh, I've worn and, and, and I have a, a real connection with and I really love that piece. And I think, you know, the next generation, whoever inherits it, will be will definitely remember me by and absolutely worth inheriting, no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, the drawback of the mid-tier is that not every watch in this category is going to tick all the boxes and you'll see this as we go through the watches you've got to think to yourself what are you going to wear the watch for uh, when are you going to wear it what is the purpose of the watch in your collection what do you like to wear what you know some watches might not suit your outfit some stylistically might not suit you you've got to think about these things this will give you a better indication and also Think about the budget going into this. This will help you, especially if you're stuck between two or three of these uh, models. And especially when you'll wear it, if it's a day-to-day -day thing, then, I mean, pretty much they're all great day-to-day -day watches, but some of them, for example, the Marathon isn't gonna work, work with a suit, whereas the uh, Christopher Ward on a beautiful crocodile strap looks very smart and very formal. So you've got to kind of bear in mind your style and what you're going to be wearing, that will give you a better indication. And you'll probably end up buying, you know, a Glycine Combat Sub and a Squire, for example, or, or, or a, a Marathon and a Christopher Ford. You never know. And that's why we collect watches, because we have to, you know, we, we wear watches on different days, depending on our mood, our taste, what we're wearing, what the event is, formal, casual, all the rest of it. This is why we have collection. Well, one of the many reasons why we have collections. So it really is what matters to you and specifically to you and your requirements and your needs. So keep all of that in mind. Okay, guys, I've been blabbering on far too long. Let's switch perspectives now and have a closer look. Today, we're finally doing the showdown between these five amazing mid-range watches uh, all priced around about the $1,000 range you'll see there's four here and unfortunately we, the Aquas is being uh, represented <laughs> in pictorial form 
buy my iPhone. Unfortunately, I don't currently own an Aquas. I've owned two. I've reviewed them. I've jeweled them. I, I love them dearly and I miss my Aquas immensely. But I do feel qualified enough to talk about it even in its absence. Uh, I know there are a lot of channels out there like love to talk about watches they've never even held or touched or and especially if they talk badly about watches they've never experienced but I'm not like that uh, I can genuinely say I know this watch like the back of my hand and I'm always considering rebuying it but it had to go I had to sacrifice it to buy other watches you know I'm not I'm not loaded um, I would love to own all the watches uh, I want but you know unfortunately we can't we have to live in the real world anyway so what I've decided to do I I've decided to simplify uh, the jewel. It's not a jewel, obviously, because there's five watches. It would take so long to go into all the categories for all the watches. I thought we'd simplify it to their each watch's core strength, uh, their positives and negatives. Also, we got the full scores here. Now, I've jeweled a lot of watches. We just recently jeweled these two watches against each other, and that is how we get the scores. Now, if you want to see each watch in more detail check out the reviews also check out the comparisons or the jewel videos where we derived these scores from so let's uh, just summarize why these watches are all together in the same category well they're all mid-range they're all swiss made automatic watches they're all diver watches as well they're also they're around the same price some of them are a little bit over a grand most of them are under a grand but there's quite an astonishing difference in their designs in their quality and we're going to go into all of that in just a second we'll start off with the glycine combat sub what are its positives what are its negatives well it got a 90 it's got a high score now this particular one is the golden eye which is this is a called a combat sub special the special because it's a slightly more kind of tarted up version with this gold and, and pvd case of course there are lots of other different versions of the uh, the glycine combat sub but its positives definitely are that it's one of the slimmest divers i've ever ever worn it's incredibly comfortable despite the same you know it's negative of being a 42 i think if it was a 40 it would have been even more amazingly comfortable but it wears incredibly well because of these curved lugs the finish the quality is all fantastic that's why it scored so highly i'm really getting a well-made piece here uh, it definitely scores points for its variation i mean there's so many different designs of this it's amazing to think this is the same watch as some of the other versions and they look dramatically different uh, just from the different colors and the different finishing some of them look so different you hardly believe it's the same uh, you know within the same range of watches I've put also negatives the loom the loom on this one is a little bit disappointing because it's so small but you know not really a massive I, I to be honest I struggled to think of the negatives of this watch it scored so highly anyway the price is also a bit of a negative price really does fluctuate I'm not going to give precise figures because you know I don't want to be called out and oh you said this you said that but I think it, it, it's a tiny little bit more expensive than it really should be but generally you're getting a good watch for the money and, and a very unique design and, and like I said incredibly comfortable and it scored really highly simply because of the the variety you get in design uh, the amazing quality and also it's glycine glycine have the iconic airman which we're going to review soon and of course the combat sub and there's so much variation within those ranges. You're getting a really quality Swiss uh, brand and watch there. Moving on to the Oris Aquas, which is uh, which we haven't actually got. I'm showing you this GIF because it has all the different combinations. Um, now, this Oris Aquas got an 87. Now, why did it get an 87? Well, the, the minuses are pretty big minuses. Despite having one of the best bracelets and rubber straps I've ever experienced in a watch, it is an integrated uh, lugs if you see there. I love NATO straps. I love putting different straps on it. You can only really put it on either the rubber band or the bracelet, which kind of limits your, your enjoyment of the watch. Also the price, these things can go up. I think they should have priced them below a thousand. You can get them below a thousand on the gray market, but I think their retail price is a little over the top, especially for the Salita. I mean, they have got a nice kind of, ro you know, Oris Rotor and all the rest of it. But again, I think the price is a little bit too high. Got a respectable 87, very strong score. Mainly the, the, the scores came in for its completely unique, beautiful, modern, contemporary design that is unlike anything. Very original. It's extremely high quality for the money. I mean, I, I actually said in the video that 
it rivals the, the Omega Seamasters in, in the finishing and quality. It really does. I'm not exaggerating. And also the heritage of uh, Oris, like I said in the uh, previous part of the video, they're doing amazing. They've, they've done some amazing achievements, especially in the last few years, hundred over 100 years of being fully independent, great great brand and they're not trying to be anything they're being oris and, and i think uh, they're hugely underrated anyway moving on the marathon well m the marathon scored the lowest here and that's mainly because well it's the same thing that makes the marathon so unique it's the same thing that that kind of made it lose its uh, some of the highest scores it's this out of all of them is the truest to a diver tool watch it truly is a tool watch it's a very kind of has a marmite effect its design is is well its design is all about function everything from the from the bezel to the cr knurled crown to the drilled lug holes to the case there's no embellishment there's no ostentatious design you know all the others I uh, really do play with aesthetics and are more stylish where this is just brutish and, and almost like kind of uh, brutalist architecture from the 1960s. It's harsh, it's uh, unforgiving, it's all about function, there's no attempt to, it's not a pretty boy but yet somehow it's kind of appealing and there is something appealing about it. So design is, is also a big plus because it's, it's the truest to a real dive watch. But also kind of a minus as well because it's not very aesthetically pleasing even though some people really really do like the harsh down to business aesthetic that it that it uh, has also it's not very versatile because of this harsh look i mean you cannot wear this with any kind of formal clothes it would look out of place with the suit um i mean i'm not saying you can't do it but it just would you know let's 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 be honest definite plus is its robustness this thing is hard as nails it really is it's it it just screams military it just screams you know let's let's get down to business a bit of respect for that as well anyway let's move on so that was the marathon then of course my favorite of the bunch and it's i'm no secret about this i i've i fell in love with the uh, squire uh, head over heels with the 1521 uh, it's funny when I was looking at it online and I first bought the very first one I had which was a black dial and, and black bezel you know I was I wasn't sure about it and then I ordered it and it arrived and I was just yeah, it just blew me away how beautiful and, and the attention to detail and the finishing and um, it's not a perfect watch, you know, it has probably the weakest bezel. This particular one's not too bad, this is the upgraded one with the screws, but, you know, it's not the, it's not the best bezel in the world, but it's, it still works, you know, it's, it still works. And the loom, you see that, you see the, the play. It's not the best bezel in the world, certainly not, but it works, it does the job. The loom also is, is not amazing, certainly not a Seiko loom that they're famous for, but uh, it's certainly not the weakest loom here. What makes the Squire so close to my heart is that it's a really stylish, stylish watch and very, very unique. It's not. It's totally its own thing, and I, there's nothing else out out there like it. It's got such charm to it. It's got such oh, just the color schemes. I love the Azura version. This particular one is an absolute keeper. I I, I stupidly sold it and then, then I bought it back and. I've sworn to myself I'll never sell it again. Also, I just love that orange hand and, and the curves of it. It's just a very sexy watch. The little details are just very elegant and uh, just so playful and fun. And, and just make, I know this sounds ridiculous, but this watch actually makes me happy to be alive. I know it sounds completely ridiculous, but it brings me an enjoyment and uh, that... Not many other watches do. It's just fun, you know. It's fun, you know. Look at that dial. I mean, come on, look at that dial. It's a gorgeous piece. So, you know, we've mentioned that the loom isn't that great and the bezel is not amazing. But what watch is perfect? But uh, I'm willing to forgive it because it's just so gorgeous. Um, and these things, they they hold pretty good value. And considering it's a mid-range piece, and you know, only real kind of connoisseurs of watches will kind of know about this. So it got really high marks. I mean, and I think the value is fantastic, considering the quality is there, the finishing the case. I mean, you can see why they made cases for Doxon and Blancpain, Hoyer, and all the rest of it. This 
Case is just amazing. Anyway, um, so big, strong, fat 92 there for the for the Squire. So moving on, last of all, we have the Christopher Ward C60 Trident Pro. This, is, of course, is the 38 millimeter version. I love the fact that they come in those two sizes. Really does boost the score up. I love the Christopher Ward. I think it's a great, great watch for the money. It's uh, definitely the the plus is it's its affordability it's the cheapest watch here and yet you know you're getting ceramic bezel you, you, which i've also put it's also very very smart my only negative is that it plays it very very safe it's almost kind of too eager to please it's i've put conservative conservative really is just a is a polite way of saying it's a little bit boring i don't want to say it's boring it's it's got some real beauty to it but it's a subtle watch it's not trying to it's like i mean let's compare it to the the Squire, the Squire just is like, hello, you know, let's go on a holiday, let's go to the beach, it's Miami Beach, this is Miami Beach, whereas this is a, a quiet beach, you know, in the south of France, it's very unassuming, there's hardly anybody on it, but it has got a kind of class to it. This is Miami Beach, this is, this is, hello, look at me, I'm more highly polished and very flash and bright colours and lots of um, pizzazz and, and, and uh, life to it. This is very understated, and and I like that. It's tasteful. It's classic design. It's it's gonna age well, you know, and, and that's a great thing. Also, it's lack of history. I mean, Squale, Marathon, Oris, Glycine. These little companies all have amazing heritage and history to them. Uh, especially Oris and Squale, probably the the most out of out of all of them. I mean, having said that, Marathon is very unique military background as well but this one doesn't have any history but they're making up for it in its price in what they offer for the money like the ceramic bezel uh, like the high quality finishing all the rest of it they're kind of trying to make up for that by offering a lot which is great i think christopher Ward are going to do big big things in the future but it doesn't really have any heritage to it let's be honest you know let's let's call it a spade a spade it does not have the heritage let's say that squire has or even the glycine, you know, it's just it's just not there. But they're a new company, they're the new kid on the block, and this is an extremely competitive offering. You've got to respect them. Anyway, guys, that's my kind of breakdown of these five watches. Uh, you can find out all, much more about them on all their individual reviews and uh, jewels and all the rest of it. I'm going to leave it there. Let's take it back to the studio. Okay, welcome back, guys. Now, thoughts, queries questions opinions all the rest of it please down in the comments below i'd really like to hear your thoughts which are your favorites uh, if you could pick one out of the five which would you pick and also watches that you think i've overlooked that should be considered in this category i know um, a lot of you like the long jeans i think it's hydro conquest that's it i know a lot of you like that watch as well i've just still haven't got around to uh, reviewing it i will eventually guys if you think of watches in this kind of price range that would be worthy of comparing to these top five. This is my personal top five, bear in mind. So obviously there's a whole world of divers out there, but I really think within this five, there's something for everybody. So I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video. If you enjoyed it and found it useful, it really does help me. And as always, I'll catch you in the next one. Okay guys, ciao.